Hello, um, this video today is um, with reference to your final writing assignment. Um, today I've opened the, uh, the, the submission portal for that as well as um, the proposal uh, forum. Um, and uh, I've done so largely to give you a lot of time to be thinking about these questions and um, preparing and thinking about how you're going to respond to these questions. It's a fairly short writing assignment. Um, uh, the instructions tell you it's a uh, thousand to, to 1250 words. Um, thousand words should be about four pages, right? So it's four or five pages. Um, it's sort of a reflection paper, uh, but in this reflection paper you're expected to make an argument. Um, so uh, basically how this works is um, we've studied six theorists in this class and um, I've given you three questions. So you pick two theorists and one of these questions which are uh, by their very nature designed to be very general kinds of questions. Um, I fully expect that uh, you'll have to refine them or adapt them um, in order to engage topics that you're interested in uh, or in order to make them more refined points that you're going to want to make um, as you're arguing through your short writing assignment uh, in this class. Um, so basically what I've tried to do is isolate an overarching theme um, from the class, uh, something that each of the theorists that we've engaged with um, themselves have a position that speaks to. So um, it, it, this, is, this is the idea. Um, so your written work must relate to and discuss the work of no less than two of the figures that we've studied in this course. Um, so effectively what you will be doing is choosing one of these questions and two of the theorists, the first part of the paper, will sort of introduce the relevant aspects of the theorist positions. Um, and then you will turn to an argument um, that addresses the, 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 the overarching theme question that you've chosen and refined. Um, so uh, the due date for this, like I say, is Monday, April 24th at 11.55 p.m. That's five minutes to midnight, just so that we don't have any um, confusion about that. Uh, you're submitting uh, these assignments to the Moodle portal by this date and time, um, and uh, really this is your final assignment. Um, once I set this, uh, this deadline, I have 48 hours in order to get your grades in, so I need them all there on time which is part of the reason I'm giving you uh, this assignment way ahead of time so that um, so that you'll have plenty of time to work on it. Uh, so the questions, um, they all start given the argument studied in this course. So first one, given the arguments studied in this course, what should be considered the strongest or best basis for a normative claim? That is, on what basis can we say that someone should or shouldn't do something. Right? Um, effectively, each of the theorists that we've studied in this course do this. I mean, for Socrates, he based his normative claims on an epistemological understanding. Um, for Aristotle, he um, based his normative claims on a notion of a human essence as it's sort of interpreted as a human function. Right? So, um, the virtues are simply us expressing um, the excellence of our capacities. Right? Um, uh, for Kant, uh, really, it's, it's this reason in, in putting our inclination or de our desires in brackets. Um, for the utilitarians, it's pleasure and pain. For Nietzsche, as we'll see, um, he's got an interesting way um, to, 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 to ground or establish a normative claim in terms of a theme of health. And um, for, um, for Sartre, it will be this sort of tension between freedom and responsibility. Right. So, um, it, with regard to this, uh, it basically it's a critical assessment of um, no less than two figures um, it, with regard to how they establish a normative claim. And when you choose your two figures, choose them carefully so that you can use one to help you make a point 
with um, the, the second one who you think is the strongest, right? Um, mind you, you don't have to agree with even any of the theorists that we've discussed in this course. If you're choosing two theorists that both come up short in interesting ways, you can use that to make your own point. Um, you could also argue that these two theorists, well presented as distinct, are compatible with one another in an important respect. And these would be interesting ways um, to make your argument. Right? Um, the second question, given the argument studied in this course, what status does the faculty of reason have as a moral faculty for Kant, um, Aristotle, and, uh, and, and Finger, Finger, Socrates? Um, reason really was um, the, the be-all and end-all of a moral faculty. Recall that for each of these theorists, even though Aristotle to some extent invites emotions to the table, reason still offers us a perspective from which we can evaluate, harness, and direct our emotional content. Um, to a certain extent, what we see in both Socrates and Kant is an attempt to put emotions in brackets and bring free reason to um, the fore because it's because we're rational, according to these theorists, that we are capable of acting morally, uh, that is, limiting our desires. Right? As we'll see from Mill, um, essentially, um, the reason is a complicated calculator right, to determine um, what the greatest good, that is, pleasure, right, in the absence of pain is going to be with regard to the outcome of our actions, right? So reason becomes a calculator, essentially. Uh, for Nietzsche, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see as we engage with Nietzsche, essentially reason is a tool of desire and cannot offer a perspective distinct from our desire. So reason is actually sort of a weak moral tool. Right? And while Sartre not arguing that we should be rational above all is at the same time not arguing that reason is the be-all and end-all in terms of a moral faculty. Really, reason is a tool that we use to show the, 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 the sort of logical and existential sort of um, consequences of our freedom in a form of responsibility, right? And it's a non-hypocriticalness or authenticity that um, Sartre is going to be aiming for in his moral philosophy. So uh, three of the th figures that we've studied put reason at the top and another three of those figures wind up sort of questioning the value of reason as the be-all and end-all of moral faculties. They, 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 they center ethics around not reason but something else. Right? Um, and then finally question number three here, given the argument studied in this course, in what sense can, it be, uh, can we be said to be free or what does freedom mean? Right from the beginning of this course, um, essentially, uh, I have argued that none of this makes any sense. And any normative claims, any should claims, you should do this and not that, they don't make any sense unless we, in some sense or another, are free. Um, for Plato, for not Plato, for Socrates, you see, I fall into my own trap there. For Socrates, um, essentially, freedom had to had to do with exercising our human capacities for reason, right? thus freeing us from the short, short chain of our desires. In some senses, this is similar to um, Kant's treatment of freedom in terms of autonomy. Right? Um, again, uh, in Aristotle, we find that freedom has to do with unleashing um, our excellence, right? So that is freedom is, um, you know, to a certain extent performing our function, right? Um, it's, it's flourishing in the exercise of our distinctive capacities, right? So sort of a straightforward notion of excellence. One of the Roderick videos gets into that. Um, so we've already handled Kant to a certain extent. Um, and Mill has 
sort of a very little bit to say um, about freedom. Um, his treatment of liberty, right, as we'll discuss, is, well, it's the first sections of On Liberty actually present the question of liberty as sort of a political freedom, right, um, sort of a sphere of protected rights or liberties, right? So freedom for Mill is a sort of a political discourse, right? Um, for Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil, we'll find he's got a rather complicated treatment of freedom um, as sort of a relative concept that is as a matter of extent. Um, he he does um, at, at one point a very interesting that will engage with four point breakdown of um, freedom of the will, right? And a couple of sections later concludes that we should stop talking about either free will or unfree will, right? Because these are sort of absolutes, but rather, right? He discusses freedom as a matter of extent. We should, we should discuss strong or weak wills, right? And then finally, for um, Jean Paul Sartre, um, basically, freedom is our most basic existential condition, right? Our condition is one that is free. So if we are absolutely in all cases free, whether we're chained to a wall or living under an oppressive system, largely what that means is a matter of our choosing and we still have absolute responsibility for our actions. So um, for Sartre, freedom is an existential condition um, and an existential obligation. Right? It's something that's basic to our condition as human beings. So um, I've, I've tried, like I say, to ask general questions. If you want to say something specific about freedom or specific about reason or something specific about making should or shouldn't claims, feel free to refine these a little bit. Right? Um, you can workshop these refinements on the discussion forum um, uh, for the paper proposals, right? I, I, I hope you can do this, sort of workshop each other's ideas. Um, you can kind of mine other people's ideas for ideas of your own, provided you're contributing to the discussion. Um, the discussion forum for this, I mark pass or fail, and what I'm looking for is a substantial plan. What I'm not looking for is I plan to do question one, and I'm using Socrates and Aristotle, period the end. That's not sufficient. Right? What I'm looking for is something more like I'm planning to approach question number one using Socrates and Aristotle. I find it interesting that um, it, it, they both kind of put reason in the driver's seat, but well, um, Socrates uses epistemology to ground ethics. Um, Aristotle uses an essentialism, which is interesting, right? Because we all have a human function and it's just a matter of expressing our excellence in terms of that human function, right? Um, so what I plan to do is argue that Aristotle's position or, or Socrates' position is superior to the other one for maybe these reasons, right? Um, the other thing to keep in mind about the uh, the forms is uh, the, the proposal form is that once you put something on there, you're not obligated in an absolute respect to that topic. Basically, I'm trying to get you thinking about this before the deadline. So the forum is going to close, I think I said on the 18th, um, whereas this is due the 24th, right? So um, it, because if the forum, it, which is designed to get you thinking about this in advance, it closed on the 24th at 11.55, you might just do, so what I did in my paper is, and you wouldn't be thinking about this in advance, right? So um, the forum is worth 5% of your final grade. This is worth 20. <coughs> So um, you'll see a grade out of 20 appear um, once I assess each of these. Um, for your reference, uh, I posted a very general sort of sample structure for writing philosophy papers to uh, Moodle as well. Um, use it if it helps, right? Um, but it is a suggestion, right? Maybe a tool that might help some of you organize your ideas. You don't, if you've got a style that works for you, use that, do what's comfortable. Right. Um, 
Zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. Um, this is fairly standard. This is the same as all of the tests. Um, it's spelled out very clear terms um, on the syllabus. Don't do it. Um, if you do do it, um, not only do you fail the course, but um, you're passed on to uh, the review board through the Depart uh, uh, Dean of Students office. It's just what my contract says I have to do. Um, it, essentially, your task is to uh, create an original work of academic art here. Right? Um, and if you don't do that, and instead pass somebody else's work off as your own in the context of an ethics class, you, you know that's wrong already, right? Um, and in the context of the university, it's a prohibited activity. So um, you could get kicked out of school for it. So don't do it. You're better, you're better to just do your own work. If you're using um, sources external to um, the course, external to what's rattling around in your own brain, um, it's I don't care a citation method. It doesn't matter. Pick one, use it, uh, be consistent. The point is if I go looking for it or if any of your readers go looking for your source, they should be able to find it. Um, if you're unsure about how and under what, what circumstances you're supposed to cite um, on the course syllabus, I posted a link to uh, CiteWrite, which is a program that runs through the library um, put on by the Academic Writing Center. That's excellent. That actually gives you a breakdown of um, what you're supposed to do with regard to uh, citations and uh, plagiarism avoidance, right? which is your responsibility. Well, we're talking about responsibility. Um, and uh, I have to admit, even more than uh, the rest of your assignments, I really look forward to reading your responses to this paper because this is the point in the course where you're actually yourself cutting your teeth on philosophy. So it's you yourself are making arguments rather than relating back arguments other people made. So um, it's it, I'm interested to see what you do with this assignment. Um, over the years, I've seen a lot of very interesting and compelling sort of responses to this. Um, so I, I expect you all to be awesome. Right? Uh, and I look forward to uh, having that expectation confirmed. All right. If you have any questions, email me or come see me in my office hours. All right. Have wonderful days, one for each of you.